Hello brothers and sisters, uh, we are about to have our midweek Bible study. It's more than midweek actually, but uh, let us start with a word of prayer. Gracious God, thank you Lord for the gift of life and for your blessings. I thank you Lord for the word that you have given to us, the word of God that we are able to read it, be inspired, be cleansed, and increase our knowledge of you. Lord, as we look at the last part of Psalm 119, guide us in our thoughts and nail those things that, ought to be, that, ought, that we ought to be mindful of in our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Uh, today we're looking at the last, last section that we had uh, talked about, uh, Psalm 119, 145 to 176. Um, and so today what we're going to do, uh, it's, it's a big section, so... We're going to try to uh, uh, be brief, and so what we're going to focus on is on one of the approaches when it comes to uh, biblical study, and that is something called recurrence or repetition. And so when the Bible uh, repeats a word, a phrase, or even an idea, uh, it's trying to emphasize it, and so the biblical student is, is, has to find out why it is being repeated. For example, in the book of John, uh, Jesus has the 10 I am statements, you know. I am the door, I am the good shepherd, that sort of thing. So, so, so you, you've got to find out uh, what does it mean and then also uh, what is he trying to emphasize, you know, in doing that. Well, that's what we're going to look at here today. So we've got to go real quick. Uh, in verses uh, 145 through 152, which is called the Kof section, uh, the situation that David or the psalmist has been going through continues. Uh, God's enemies and his own personal enemies have encircled him and they don't like him because he loves the Word of God and they do not love the Word of God or the law of God. Uh, so three times it says, in this section, I cried, as in, I called out loudly, kind of like I shouted, not in, not in complaint, but in his prayer, he is really needing to hear God's voice. So three times it says, I cried, and it, and it kind of tells you how he's being motivated by the situation that he's in. Uh, interestingly, he says he does this before the night watches. Now there's uh, four night watches at 6, 9, 12, 3 a.m., 3 a.m. So we, it doesn't really say, does it mean uh, uh, before 6 p.m., before the first watch, I was praying? Or does it say, is it trying to say before each one? Or does, is it just simply saying in the middle of the night? I was crying out to God, and I, I, I suspect it was that, you know, kind of, it's, it's, it's in the middle of the night, it's in the night sometime, uh, that's, that's kind of what, what I think uh, he means. So in his case, the psalmist prefers to seek God in the loneliness of the night. I think that is one of the things that we want to take away from this section, the Kof section, that, uh, that he's crying, praying loud to God because of what he's experiencing, but he also does it in the loneliness of the night. Uh, you know how it is, the hustle and bustle of the day is very, very distracting, right? But when it's calm and it's dark and it's night and you're alone, it's the perfect time to pour out your heart before God. So I think that's what he is experiencing here. In verses 153 to 160, which is the Resh, called the Resh section, <clears throat> the situation is the same, except that he just changes the, the words. Uh, that is to say, the people around him. But in this case, he calls them the wicked, the persecutors, the enemies, the transgressors. So you got all kinds of people, wicked, persecutors, enemies, transgressors, transgressors of the law. And so he really feels 
pressured by 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 the situation that they caused just by being around him. You know, he's he's kind of crushed. It seems to me, uh, and it almost seems like they are snuffing his his faith out. I mean, that's kind of the feeling that you get here, because notice that he he pleads to God in his prayer in, in this section, and he says. Uh, deliver me twice, save me twice, but he also says, quicken me three times. That is to say, that is the old old uh, old English way of saying, uh, resurrect me. So he's saying, save me, quicken me, restore me, resurrect me. Because the situation is just snuffing the, fight, the faith out of me. So obviously he's going through some very hard times. And yet, you know, he has this disposition to, to study the Word of God. Or not, not to study the Word of God, but to, to depend on the Word of God. Uh, at a time, brothers and sisters, I mean, it's easy to say it now, but... He's depending on the Word of God when there is no such thing as a Bible. The only, they only have the, the first few books up until his time, right before his time. Even the Psalms are just like, they're scattered and, and they're not considered the Word of God yet. So it's not like if he's talking about his own Psalms or anything like that. You know, it, it, he's talking about uh, the first five books and, and, and probably Ruth. Joshua and Judges, maybe Job. We're not sure, but that's I mean that's it. I mean there's there's nothing. There's no other word of God. There's no other Bible, and there are not books that people can just get out of the library. Uh, it had to be from what he knew, from from what he learned uh, in, in the instruction that was given him. So, so he still trusts God, even though he's he feels that his faith is being snuffed out. Um, the next section is uh, 161 through 168, and this one is called the Shin, Shin uh, section, which uh, incidentally is uh, Shim uh, is related to the word El Shaddai, the Almighty, or the Almighty God, or Shaddai, powerful. Uh, but so let's see. The beginning of this section, uh, once again, <laughs> I mean, uh, it almost instructs us, brothers and sisters, that if you decide to follow Jesus, if you decide to follow the Lord, if you decide to follow the Word of God, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to have trouble. People won't understand you. And, and, and they're going to create a lot of stress and pressure around you. Uh, even those people of his court, I think this is the one where he talks about his own court. Yes, so he starts out by talking about the persecution in his own palace, in the, in, in the, in the, the, royal, the royal place. So to me, it's got to be David. I mean, who else can it be? But uh, so... This is, think about this, brothers and sisters. This is where the leadership of the nation comes from. Let's suppose that it is David. Okay, his kingship is absolute, but he depends on the leadership, on the elders. The elders are not all people. The elders are the, the rulers of each tribe, which is also a very powerful position. So you got 12 of those. And then beyond that, you have uh, uh, his own his own relatives, other princes, uh, other counselors, uh, the military, and that sort of thing. So, if a lot of these people are against you, uh, he feels this is. But this is where the leadership is. So, if there is turmoil within the leadership, uh, it can have a potentially negative effect on the rest of the nation. 
So this is where this is what David is is is, uh, is struggling with. Uh, but the line that we want to follow, you know, the the, the, the line of thought that we want to follow, is how the psalmist thinks of the law or the word of God. Let's see how he thinks of the word of of God. Again, it's only the Torah and a couple of other books, but notice what he says. In the midst of persecution, I am in awe of the word of God. I rejoice at thy word. I love thy law. Seven times a day, I praise thee for thy judgments. I love thy testimonies exceedingly. And the last one, I love thy precepts and testimonies. So you wonder, well, wait a minute, I thought you were under pressure, I thought your faith was being snuffed out, I thought that, that everybody's against you, he's persecuted. You'd think that, that everybody around him is rejoicing just like him. But do you see? There's something overpowering about the personal relationship with God. And you know, you know that God is with you. Even if everyone is against you, you know that God is with you. And so you're able to rejoice. Reminds me of Richard Wormbrand again. I'm in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word. I love thy law. Seven times a day I praise your judgments. I love thy testimonies exceedingly. And I love thy precepts and testimonies. I mean, my, I don't know what else he can say. <laughs> I think we know that he loves the Word of God, and he loves God, and that's the, really the, the, the thing about it. So, in the midst of the hardship, the psalmist experiences the psalmist experiences uh, what the psalmist experiences with the Word of God far outweighs the bitterness. It doesn't mean that the bitterness is not bitter, <laughs> right? And that the stress and the pressure and the hate around him. It doesn't mean that it disappears. It's there. But the surge of the joy of God, the surge of the joy, the peace of God, overpowers his bitterness. Again, it sounds so much like, like Richard Wurmbrand in that cell. So this is not a intellectual, an intellectual exercise. Like, I'm going to read the first five books of the Bible, and I'm going to read Isaiah, and I'm going to read... Uh, Matthew and, and first and second, third John, and you know that's going to do it to me. It has to be that personal connection with God in the midst of that crisis. In because as as I'm going to say in just a second, when you read the Bible, you are listening to the second person of the Trinity speaking to you if, and, if, and then if Jesus himself is not speaking to you it doesn't matter what the Bible says it's not gonna it's not gonna inspire you you're not gonna be it's not gonna be overpowering to what, what is around you and last but not least the top the top section um, also every single word Every single line in Hebrew starts with the letter Tav, which is the T, and um, and there's eight lines, like every other section, you know. So, but this is the last one. So it says, uh, very very interesting. Uh, it says, the very last line says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, because I do not forget thy commandments. What a, what a thing to say. After 475 verses, you have been exalting the Word of God. He just said that he, he loves God. I mean, he loves His Word, loves it exceedingly. I love thy precepts, thy testimonies, I praise thee. All this, all this stuff of, 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 of joy and faithfulness. But the last line that he writes says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. So, what does that mean? 
I think the idea behind it is not that it is a willful strain. He has not willfully turned his back on God and just said, you know, I'm just going to do whatever. No. I think what he's talking about, it's like a ship that has been blown in a hurricane. It, 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 he has been pushed away by his persecutors, his enemies, his situation, all the resistance around him. He, he feels that he has been pushed away. And it's almost as if he's slipping away and he, he stretches his hand. He says, you know, help me, Lord, because I'm slipping. That is, I think that's, that's the idea behind what his words are saying, what his words are. He doesn't intentionally interrupt his love for, for God or the Word of God, but it's just, it just seems a little cloudy. And I think that's just human nature. Uh, you know, you wonder, what do I do? And uh, in this case, the psalmist, which I think is David, is praying. Instead of saying, I've gone astray like a lost sheep, you know, he's saying, it's another way of saying, come look for me. Come get me. Uh, I, I thought I could do it by myself or, or, or something, you know. I just need your, your, your hand and bring me home. Because, you know, a lost sheep wants to come, come back home. And I think he wants to come back home. So, so brothers and sisters, I hope that you have... Uh, been able to redeem something from our studies and I want to thank thank you all. I know there's a handful of you who have been very faithful and uh, and I praise the Lord for that and I hope that it's been helpful to you. But one last thing I want to say as we conclude our series on, on Psalm 119 and it's something that Mr. Dr. Karl Barth, Barth said. Karl Barth was a theologian who escaped Nazi Germany by the way and he said this, that to read the Bible is to hear the voice of the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, whom we later know as Jesus of Nazareth. So when you read the Bible, you're listening to the voice of the second person of the Trinity, whose name we know later to be Jesus of Nazareth. So when I read here, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant. The, the, the voice of the, of the Spirit of Jesus comes through and speaks to me in my heart and ought to speak to you as you read uh, Scripture. So let us go and do the same. Let us be dismissed, shall we? Gracious Lord, Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your children. And I pray, Lord, that we would continue to be inspired by your word because you are the word of God that speaks through the word of God. Amen. Amen.